recording this? Okay, we're going to start with the most beautiful church in St. Petersburg. Here it is right here. Uh, we are looking at it right now. So when I have guests who come to St. Petersburg and I ask them what was uh, their favorite church, uh, they often say that it was this one, the church on spilled blood. And um, it has these gorgeous onion shaped domes that are decorated with gold plating, that are decorated with gorgeous enamel. The walls of the church are decorated with mosaic. And I often hear people say, wow, for such a beautiful church, it is such a weird name. Why is it called the Church on Spilled Blood? Anyway, um, the reason why it is called the Church on Spilled Blood is because um, a blo the blood of uh, one of our Russian czars uh, was spilled here. So uh, what happened is the czar, uh, he was passing down the canal embankment in his carriage here when a terrorist threw a bomb at him. And uh, the carriage exploded and our emperor uh, died right here. So basically he had a son and his son decided to um, construct a church uh, right on the place where his father was killed. So it happened uh, right here. And what I like about this church, um, those of you who have seen views of Moscow uh, understand that this is quite traditional, you know, for Russian architecture, the beautiful onion shaped domes, the bright colors. But the thing is, um, for that time, and that was a late 19th century, this was not really typical architecture uh, for St. Petersburg. We had really European inspired buildings. So this was not really typical. And the person who was actually the author of this project was not, an uh, was not an architect by profession. The person who designed this church was a priest. And um, our emperor, when he saw the project of the church, he liked it so much that he just found an architect who would work together with this priest as a team and they would build this beautiful church. By the way, that czar, um, his name was Alexander III, he was a huge fan of ancient Russia, ancient Russian history, um, art and things like this. I'm sorry. Ancient Russian history, art and things like that. So, um, you know, that really reminded him of ancient Russian history. Anyway, uh, I'm going to take you inside this gorgeous church uh, because it's um, even more beautiful on the inside than it is on the outside. I know it's hard to believe, but it truly really is stunning even on the inside. So here is the inside view. So we are now inside the church on spilled blood. So the outside had a lot of enamel. The inside has all this gorgeous mosaic here. Uh, and it's almost hard to tell that this is mosaic, but by the way that the light reflects in here, that's pretty much how we can tell because the pieces are so small, right? Uh, and if you look at the, if you look around, you'll see that a lot of the mosaic, it's golden, right? So that is actually made with real gold. They take uh, a little piece of gold leaf, which is a really thin layer of gold, thinner than human hair. They bake it in between two layers of glass. And this is how these mosaic pieces get created. So it's really valuable. It's really beautiful. The colors are really bright. On the columns, we have depictions of Russian saints. The idea is that um, the reason why the saints are on the columns is because the saints uh, connect us um, common people with God, just like columns connect the floor and the ceiling. So uh, that's kind of the reason behind it. And in the ceiling, of course, we have many different depictions of Jesus Christ right here, right here, and of course, right here in the very top dome, looking right at me. In front of the church, uh, you can see this little wall here. And such a wall uh, is a really necessary part for every Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, this is called the iconostasis 
or the wall with icons. And this kind of wall separates the altar, altar part of the church from the main part of the church. And only um, the priests can go behind there. Um, just church visitors are not allowed to go there. And behind that wall, there is the altar. However, in the middle of the wall, there is a little door here. And so that door would be open during the service. And if you were in the church during the service, you could peek and kind of see what the altar looks like. And that's pretty much it. The priest, though, goes in and out of the door. That symbolizes the connection of congregation and Christ. And then the priest would often go into the main uh, part of the church and bless people during the service. However, one question that I get a lot about this gorgeous church is whether it is a working church. And the thing is, it is not. This church functions as a museum and they only have services only on really big occasions, like um, Easter, Christmas, uh, birthday of the city, which is in the end of May. That's pretty much it. But the rest of the time, uh, this church functions as a museum. And really, um, the, the history of this church is so amazing. At different points of history, uh, in our history, it had so many different functions. It was almost never a regular church. So it took a while to build. I started telling you that they started in the end of the 19th century and they finished in the beginning of the 20th century. After it was built, it became a private church of the royal family. So they could only be here uh, with just by themselves or with their invited guests. People, you know, just from the street could not just come in here and attend the service. It was a private church, but it only functioned as a private church for a really little time uh, because as you know in the very beginning of the uh, 20th century in 1917 we had a revolution and after the Russian Revolution our country became officially atheist yes some people did believe in God but the official line of the Communist Party was that um, in order to become a member of the Communist Party you had to be atheists so uh, in the Soviet times, a lot of the churches located all over the country, some were destroyed, but the majority was actually repurposed. So what the communist government did was take some churches and turn them into other things. So this gorgeous church actually functioned as a storage. It was a storage for uh, theater decorations at first. Then during World War II, it functioned as a storage for vegetables. They even called it church on spilled potatoes at some point. Anyway, um, because of its function, um, nobody really took good care of the church. And kind of by the end of the 20th century, it was in horrible shape. At some point there was even a plan to blow it up. Can you imagine that this church might not have existed anymore? But yeah, they wanted to blow it up and maybe construct a metro station here on this very spot. Um, thank God, maybe we should thank Russian Soviet bureaucracy. <laughs> it took a really long time to pass papers here and there. And so it never really happened. And in 1970s, they decided that they wanted to restore it and make it a museum. Things became much less strict. Um, they started, you know, having a little bit more respect for history. Anyway, uh, they decided to restore the church. And can you believe the restoration of this church took longer than the construction? The construction took 24 years and it took 27 years to restore. Anyway, the restoration was only completed in 1997. So it's been a museum ever since. And um, yeah, it hasn't been that long. And inside here, uh, this is the place where the czar who died on this place was murdered. Under that canopy is actually a piece of the pavement, pavement uh, where his carriage was going. Uh, so yeah, it's possible to go all the way there and really see a piece of 19th century pavement. Yeah, so this is amazing. But it's, a, it's a museum. Uh, the next church that I'm going to show you it's actually still a working church, even though it is a historic building. I'm going to take you there. Here it is, the gorgeous church. Right here. 
This church is located on the main street of our city. The main street is called Nevsky Avenue. Here it is on the other side. This church faces the main street right here. There are a lot of gorgeous buildings. So for a really long time, this was actually the main church of the Russian Empire. Uh, and it was inspired by St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Those of you who have been in Rome might recognize the same colonnade and the circular shape. Anyway, so that was a church that was constructed in the early 19th century to commemorate a victory. It was really common to construct churches to commemorate victories. This was the victory over Napoleon. Um, Russians are really proud of two big victories. One over Napoleon, the other one, the victory in World War II. Well, uh, after World War II, we weren't officially a religious country, so we weren't really uh, <laughs> building churches then. Anyway, in front of the church, there are actually monuments to the war generals uh, from the time of the war with Napoleon. Here it is. This is a uh, general from France, Barclay de Tolly, uh, but he was fighting on our side. And here is the Russian General Kutuzov. We're actually about to go inside the church. And General Kutuzov, who played a major role in our victory, um, is buried inside the church. So let me take you inside. Unlike the previous church that we just saw, this one is actually a functioning church. And you can really see the difference here. Here we are, inside the functioning church. It's pretty big, you know, it was, as I said, for a really long time, it was the main church of the Russian Empire. Here it is decorated with beautiful granite columns, marble floor, and a lot of other marble decorations on the walls. But the first thing that catches one's eye is probably this giant line, right? So what are all these people lining up for? Uh, do you have any ideas? What do you think they're lining up for? Maybe communion? That's a great idea. <laughs> it's a great guess. Uh, but there is actually no service going on. Right? The doors are closed. Uh, so they are all uh, lining up uh, to kiss this miraculous icon that is located over here. It's called the icon of Virgin Lady of Kazan. Kazan is a town in the south of Russia. Um, and this miraculous icon was first found there. So it's believed that this icon can cure people and really make your deepest wishes come true. So people line up in front of the icon, ask for something they really, really wish deeply, uh, and it's believed that the icon helps them. Um, so here they are. <laughs> and um, I was sharing earlier um, that I like how Russian Orthodox churches are organized. This seems like a really big space. There's a lot of space, but Russian churches have a lot of little cozy nooks. Like they're over there, over here. And Russians, when they go into the church, they stand in front of an icon. They have candles. You can buy candles at the entrance. And they really, I think the essence of going to church for most Russian people is not actually attending a service and listening to the service, but it's more to pray. Lots of people have their favorite icons. And same as in Catholic church and a lot of other religions, different saints can be patron saints of different things. So for example, um, if you are a student, there is a patron saint of students, there is patron saint of sailors and many more. And of course you have your name saint as well. And you just can have some privacy and stand next to that icon and uh, really pray. Of course, we do have services. In fact, we have services three times a day. They're pretty short. Um, on a regular day, they're about 15 minutes. And uh, people can come and listen to the service and people really come and go as they please. Uh, because first of all, you might have noticed we have no benches or pews. So you can easily move around the church during the service. 
Uh, and also, um, in general, it's not a sermon. Uh, during our service, we have a choir that sings. The church actually has balconies. Um, this church's balconies are over there. Um, over there. Um, there is a choir there. Uh, and they sing in ancient Slavic, so people don't uh, always fully understand what they're actually singing about. But the church, uh, the service itself, is beautiful. The singing is beautiful. The incense uh, that they use during the service. It's, it certainly creates an atmosphere, but I think that for a lot of people, it's much more important to actually find their icon and go and pray uh, with their icon. And in the in case of this particular church, also to find the miraculous icon and to pray to that icon. Anyway, uh, so this is a Russian Orthodox church. However, we have also um, a lot of other uh, churches for other religions in St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg uh, was, um, from its start in the early um, 18th century, it was planned to be a multicultural city. Uh, the plan of the rulers um, was to make Russia a European country, the kind of country who could rival some big European countries. And the thing is, by the early 18th century, when our country was founded, we didn't really um, always, we couldn't always really compete with Europe. Um, so our Russian rulers, uh, they started inviting architects, artists, scientists from Europe. And not all of them were Russian Orthodox. They had their own religions, right? And that is how we started having, started getting a Catholic community, a Protestant community, uh, even a Buddhist community. Anyway, uh, the next church that I'm going to show you, first from the outside, is a Protestant church, a Protestant church of St. Peter. It's very modest looking. It's actually really close to the church that we just saw. So we are now standing on our main street, uh, Nevsky Avenue. Here it goes down here. This is our beautiful cathedral that we just saw. And kind of hidden deep in this little nook is this Protestant church of St. Peter. Uh, it functioned as a Protestant church since the late 18th century. And then, similar to the Church of Spilled Blood, during the Soviet times, our government decided not to destroy it, but instead to repurpose it. I'm about to show you a picture of what this church looked like during the Soviet times. You can kind of see <laughs> it loading here. So uh, in the Soviet times, this was a swimming pool. Hmm. Yep. Can you believe it? And there was a swimming pool inside the church. Here it is. This is what it looks like right now. And you can see the same church walls. And yep, they just made a swimming pool right there. I mean, it's a great location. It's right on the main street, right? And even the way that the church looks like now, it's kind of cool because you really can see, you know, Basically, they just filled up the pool. This is a tile floor. Um, those were the old pool seats, right? Let's look here. The old pool seats. So they really didn't change much, just to, uh, got rid of the main pool part, but that's about it. So that's pretty cool. And this church has um, the main organ in St. Petersburg located right here. So uh, music students, um, often come to practice uh, playing the organ here. Uh, and uh, when I uh, would go inside this church with my guests, not only does it really look cool because you get to see the swimming pool, uh, but um, you also really get to listen to them practice the organ, which is really fun. They play a lot of really fun tunes, not always religious ones. So this is really cool. Anyway, if you think that um, having a church function as a swimming pool <laughs> was crazy, 
let me show yeah. you another thing. <laughs> um i know crazy right storage swimming pool uh it was uh oh let me you know let me take a little detour i'm gonna show you a church um uh it was also a protestant church oh wait it was a lutheran church um that was a movie theater so I'm gonna show you that too. Oh, here. So here is this really rare church. So this is not in the very city center. Here it is. Um, so this is a Lutheran church. And so this church in the Soviet times functioned as a movie theater. And um, towards the end of the 20th century, uh, when the Soviet Union had just collapsed and some churches went kind of like back to their functions, this one, uh, it was a movie theater and a different company that owns nightclubs bought it. And so they actually wanted to make a nightclub inside this church. But what happened is that uh, there was a fire in the church. They were basically ready to make it a nightclub, but there was a fire. And then there was like this time of confusion. Uh, anyway, uh, the city basically sued the company. They didn't want them to open a nightclub there and they won. And so this is now a functioning Lutheran church. Okay, uh, <laughs> a functioning Lutheran church. It still looks exactly like this after the fire but they still have services here and this is a, a really interesting space so they have a schedule of services that you can see on their website and if you are of lutheran faith you can come in here and attend the service but when the services are not happening this is actually used as like an art loft space so they often have exhibits in, uh, in here lectures performances. So this is kind of like a hidden gem of our city that mostly only locals know about. Uh, but it's amazing how complicated our history was and how many things can happen to a church, right? Anyway, so we saw one that was a swimming pool. We saw one that was um, a movie theater or an almost a nightclub. Now let me show you this. The next church that I'm going to show you, and I'm going to go ahead and start with a drawing of what it looked like during the Soviet times. Uh, this church uh, during the Soviet times was an anti-religion museum. <laughs> okay, that's crazy. So they in the Soviet times had an anti-religion museum inside the church. And so here is a drawing of what it looked like. They had, um, you know, little exhibits, kind of like propaganda exhibits that said, you know, why religion is wrong. And in the middle of this church, uh, they had um, what was called Pendulum Foucault. You can kind of see a picture of it here. So the idea of Pendulum Foucault is that um, it's a mechanism that can prove that the earth rotates. If you hang a pendulum high enough and I'm not a scientist, <laughs> okay, so that's how I understand it. If you hang a pen pendulum high enough uh, and it hangs, hangs to the floor, there's this circle here. And so uh, around the perimeter of the circle, they had um, these little uh, wooden sticks. You can see them here, right? And as the pendulum goes back and forth, back and forth, it actually moves in a circle. And if the pendulum itself knocks down all of these sticks eventually. And this is how they prove that the earth rotates. And so the idea of this anti-religion museum was to show people that, um, you know, religion goes against science because as we know historically there was a time when uh the church did not believe that the earth was round and that it rotated wait that the earth rotated right uh and so here it is you know and this museum was kind of using this historic fact to show people why religion was wrong anyway you can kind of see from these drawings that this is actually a gorgeous church right so 
I'm going to take you inside this church uh, with a Google panoramic view so you can enjoy <laughs> what it looks like as not an anti-religion museum. Here it is, and here we are. Here is the gorgeous wall with icons uh, right in front of us here. Uh, and I kept telling you, when the altar door is open, you can have a peek into what the altar looks like. And so we can do it now. Uh, we can have a peek here. You can see this is what the altar looks like uh, behind the altar door. And also behind the altar is the gorgeous stained glass uh, representing Jesus Christ. I love going into this church. It's really beautiful. It's a great example of a 19th century architecture, but I kind of regret uh, that I'll never be able to see this church the way it looked in the 19th century when it was constructed. I read in someone's memoirs that when this church, you know, was a functioning church during uh, the 19th century, there wasn't as much electricity in the church as you can see right now. There are, there's lots of light in it now, but on a regular Tuesday, uh, this church um, this church would be you know pretty dark uh, and candle lit. There was a lot of candle light around the church, and especially there was a lot of candle light behind the stained glass of Jesus Christ. So I read in somebody's memoirs that they would enter this church, and it would be kind of like not as bright as it is now, but there was a lot of light behind the stained glass of Jesus Christ. And it really looked like he was floating in the air in the middle of all this darkness. So to think that that's what it looked like, it sounds awesome. I would love to see it like that someday uh, with a lot of light just behind the stained glass and the rest of the church kind of dark. But that really never happens anymore. It always is really well lit now. But it's worth seeing the rest of the gorgeous um, altar wall. Um, by the way, uh, the icons on the altar wall are always arranged in the same way. On the right from the holy door, you always see Jesus Christ. On the left, there is always Virgin Mary with infant Christ. And then on the right from Jesus Christ, um, there are always uh, the saint of the church. Now, the name of this church is St. Isaac's Cathedral. And St. Isaac was a saint. Um, he was a patron saint of Peter the Great, the Tsar who founded our city. And so this we can see here is a depiction of St. Isaac. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. And you can see that he's actually holding a drawing of this church. I'm also going to show you what this church looks like uh, from the outside in a little bit. Anyway, this church is gorgeous. Uh, it is uh, a museum right now, same, same as the Church on Spilled Blood uh, that we saw in the very beginning. And there is though a little chapel right here. So if you ever really are in St. Petersburg and you visit this church, just so you know, you can go in this little nook over here. And that little chapel there is a functioning church. So there are people praying in here, uh, even services happen there uh, sometimes. But this church, same as the Church on Spilled Blood, only has services on big occasions like Christmas, Easter, uh, birthday of the city, and stuff like that. By the way, I started telling you that um, people kind of come and go during our services and we're not allowed to sit, right? If we look around. Um, there are no pews, but the Easter and Christmas services are really long. They take basically all night. And people who come to the church, they still have to stand the whole time. So this is kind of like the, one, the two services where people do try to stay the whole time and endure uh, this hardship of <laughs> standing up the whole night. Of course, it's allowed to kneel as well but it's a marble floor. I don't think it would be really comfortable. You, you can see little benches right now, but this is kind of a modern addition. Uh, traditionally, they wouldn't really have that in churches, but right now, yeah, they do add a couple benches like this so that some people can sit. Anyway, it's a huge, gorgeous church. 
uh, you might remember that I said about a different church earlier that that was the main church of the Russian Empire, right? Uh, well, eventually they decided to build a different one um, because they wanted a bigger church. St. Petersburg kept growing, more and more people were moving in there. And so they constructed this church in the middle of the 19th century to be the new main church of the Russian Empire. And so this church was built to house 4,000 people, to fit 4,000 people at the same time. So it's really big, 4,000 people. It's also really tall. We can look at the beautiful dome from the inside. Now, lots of beautiful pictures here. Uh, those are paintings. And then in the very, very top, there is a sculpture right here. It's a hanging sculpture uh, of a dove. Uh, that symbolizes Holy Spirit. We can see it right there. It looks tiny, but it's actually really big. The wingspan of this dove is two meters. It's just that the church is really, really tall and the dove is pretty far away. Anyway, here it is, the beautiful St. Isaac's Cathedral that functioned as an anti-religion museum. Well, another use for it uh, was actually the basements of the cathedral uh, because it has pretty big basements. And so during World War II, you might've heard of the Hermitage Museum, right? So the paintings from the Hermitage Museum were brought into here and uh, hidden uh, in the basements underground. So most of the paintings are preserved. Plus it was used as a bomb shelter for the people, the citizens of, uh, Leningrad. So anyway, uh, I'm glad that nobody destroyed this beautiful church. And it's definitely worth seeing from the outside. So I'm going to take you outside and show you a beautiful view of this church from the outside. Here it is. This is um, also the fourth largest dome cathedral in the world, after St. Peter's in Rome, St. Paul's in London, and Santa Maria del Fiore in Florence. Then comes this gorgeous one, St. Isaac's Cathedral. It's number four. And the decoration was just so impressive, especially for the middle of the 19th century. These are really heavy granite columns. Each weighs 120 tons. And for a while, they couldn't figure out what's the right way to put them up, right? They would need a lot of people lifting such a giant column up. So the architect came up with an idea to wrap them with ropes and connect the ropes to special turning mechanisms. And so they would turn the mechanism and the columns would stand up. So um, anyway, and that helped them lift up these columns. And they actually first put the columns up and then they constructed the church walls inside the columns because as the columns were lifted up, they would pretty much rotate and it could have broken the church wall. Anyway, there are also beautiful columns on top and it's really worth having another view of this cathedral from the top. Let me show it to you. Yeah. So what I'm about to show you is known as the colonnade of St. Isaac's Cathedral. Here it is, we're looking at it right now. Here's the colonnade. The secret of the colonnade is that, is that you can actually go all the way up here. There is a staircase inside the church and then you have to, you do have to climb a little staircase that is outside um, if you're not scared of heights. And then you get to walk around the church and uh, walk around the, this tower basically and see the most beautiful view of the city. It's so high above that you can see lots of things. Here, for example, is the beautiful Neva River, uh, the main river of our city. Right across the river, uh, these are the buildings that are part of St. Petersburg State University. The green building over here is the Hermitage Museum. Right in front of us is what is called the Admiralty. In the 18th century, that was a shipbuilding yard. Right now it's a naval school. 
and all the way in the back as the gorgeous Peter and Paul's fortress. It might be hard to see right now, but I'm going to take you closer there in just a minute. Let's look around more. The square in front of the church is gorgeous too. This uh, building over here um, was the city hall. Um, and it still is uh, the city hall. This is where the mayor of St. Petersburg works. Uh, this brown building right here is the most famous hotel in our city, known as Astoria Hotel. Uh, there is a legend that uh, during World War II, Hitler believed that he would capture our city really quickly, in just a matter of days. And he wanted to have a party to celebrate it in this hotel. Some people say he even printed out invitations for the party with a set date, and they were later discovered. I have never seen those invitations, but from some people I heard that there is a secret museum inside the hotel and they have those invitations there. I, again, never have got to see them, so I can't vouch for that, but it sounds like a beautiful story. And over here you can actually see some um, residential areas, so people actually live in some of these buildings. And some of them are, this is a big restaurant, um, some are business centers, so we are pretty high up to see a lot of um, beautiful St. Petersburg views, even the Baltic Sea over there. Anyway, I mentioned Peter and Paul's Fortress, which is on an island over there. And it's worth taking a little trip there because there is another church there. Peter and Paul's Fortress is the oldest structure in our city. It's a fortress. Uh, so St. Petersburg was founded as a result of a war. This was originally Swedish land. We conquered it. And when we conquered this land, we built a fortress here. And people actually got to live inside the fortress. You can see some of the fortress buildings here. And it was the 18th century. If people lived inside the fortress, they needed a church to go pray, of course. So this gorgeous cathedral was constructed here. And for... I keep naming <laughs> churches uh, to be the main church of the Russian Empire. In the very beginning of the 18th century, that would be the main church because the Tsar, the ruler of the uh, Russian Empire, would have most of their services here inside. This is a really tall church. Uh, you know, we were just looking at um, it from here and you can really clearly see the spire of this church right here, right? So the skyline of the fortress with the spire going up like this is actually protected by the city's government. So in the center of St. Petersburg, it's not allowed to build anything taller than this cathedral with a spire right here because the idea is that you should be able to see it from anywhere in the city center. And again, it's a signature skyline with pretty flat, low fortress walls and then the spire going up. It's really beautiful to see from the water. Anyway, the significance of this church is huge because this is the burial place of the Russian royal family, starting with Peter the Great, who uh, founded our city. So we're gonna go inside see what it looks like inside. Here we are. It doesn't look like uh, any of the churches that we've seen before, right? This was the taste of Peter the Great. He loved Europe. He was always so inspired by Europe and he really wanted um, this to look like a European church. Um, you know, so it's a, it's a vast space. It's really light colors. This might look like marble, but this is actually painted to imitate marble. But, uh, you know, Peter really wanted this to look like a European church. He was so proud that we defended Sweden in the war that he even put Swedish flags on the walls and we still have them here. Anyway, again, I said every church has its beautiful icon wall and here is the gorgeous icon wall of this church. It's made of wood that is covered with a thin layer of gold, with gold leaf. Um, gold leaf is, by the way, um, you know, really fragile material. It wears out and uh, has to be reapplied regularly. The way that this uh, wall is designed, you can really see the altar well. And there's gorgeous canopy over there uh, is what is above uh, the church's altar. Um, also, the cool thing that we can see in this church is the place 
where our czars would pray. It's right here. It's called the czar's place. And just like the common people, the czar would have to stand during the service, uh, but they got to stand under a really special canopy. This canopy has a lot of original parts. Not all of them are original, so the fabric is actually new, but the tassels and the embroidery, of course, the wooden details, all of that is original. It's a really intricate thing to do for restorers, by the way. Uh, the embroidery is made of gold and silver threads, um, and um, they actually have to be cut out of the um, fabric and reapplied onto a new fabric. It's really intricate work. Anyway, originally there were two of those canopies. Uh, one would be next to this one for the wife of the Tsar, but only this one survived. Anyway, I said that this is important because it's a burial place of the Russian royal family. So here we are. Um, these are the earliest Romanovs of the 18th century. This is the tomb of Peter the Great. By the way, they are all buried underground, so they are not actually inside of these sarcophagi. They're all in coffins underground, but these are tombs that represent them. Peter the Great, he's buried next to his wife, whose name was Catherine I, and next to them you can see their daughter, Elizabeth. And then behind, uh, you can see Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great, she was the niece-in-law of um, Elizabeth, and she came into the country to marry uh, Elizabeth's nephew, who is buried next to her. His name was Peter III. And then right behind Peter is another ruler whose name was Anna. She was his niece. Um, she was not a really prominent and famous Russian ruler. Anyway, we just saw the first Romanovs of St. Petersburg, and I'm going to take you to see the last ones, the last Romanovs of St. Petersburg. Here they are, buried in this little chapel. So this chapel is dedicated to our last royal family. Uh, it is Nicholas II, the last Russian Tsar, and uh, his wife and five kids, four daughters and one son. And uh, they're all buried underground in separate coffins, but above ground there's one sarcophagus uh, for all of them. The history of the last royal family is really sad. Um, when the revolution happened in 1917, they were put under house arrest. And then after that, uh, they were transferred to, uh, first to Siberia, then to the Ural Mountains region, where they were also kept under home arrest for a while. And then um, one night they were told that they were being transferred to a safer place. They thought that they were being transferred to Europe maybe, where they did have some relatives and in fact may, they might even have been told that they were being moved. Anyway, they were put in the basement where they were supposed to wait and as they were waiting the soldiers, the revolutionary soldiers, came into that basement and shot the whole family. That was actually their plan to execute the royal family. The problem on top of all of this was also that the royal family wasn't buried. They just took the bodies and they threw them in the coal mines, which meant that for a really long time, people actually didn't know where the royal family was. Uh, and you might have heard stories of Princess Anastasia, right? That Princess Anastasia survived. There were imposters all over the world that claimed themselves to be Princess Anastasia. Part of the reason was that, you know, People didn't know where the bodies were, what happened to the family exactly. But eventually the bodies were discovered. And our science had developed to the point that they actually could hold DNA tests, which proved that yes, this was the last royal family. They used some of the bodies from this very cathedral. Anyway, eventually the family was buried here. And in the middle here, uh, you can see an icon because our last royal family is considered martyr saints uh, in the Russian Orthodox Church. So they are now considered saints. On the walls, you can see memorial plaques um, representing different members of the family. Nicholas, Alexandra, their four daughters, their son, 
And um, over here, this plaque is dedicated to non-family members who stayed with the last royal family till the end. There were some servants who remained loyal to them until the very end. They had a family doctor that was with them and a cook uh, that also stayed with them and they were killed uh, together with them. And um, there is a memorial plaque for them. They are not buried underground here, but the memorial plaque is put there to show respect to them. Anyway, uh, they are all buried in this church. By the way, um, you might know, you might have heard that even though we say that these are the last Romanovs, it's actually not entirely true. It's the last Romanovs that ruled our country, but there were a lot of other Romanovs, their relatives, who did not have such a scary fate, who did manage to escape the country and mostly moved to Europe. And now there are descendants of the Romanovs pretty much all over the world. I heard there is one in Florida and there are a lot uh, in um, Europe, of course, especially England and France. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so they are allowed uh, to be buried here, not in the main uh, church building, but there is a little adjacent chapel where if they want to be buried there, they can. So as crazy as the Romanovs' fate was, they actually do sometimes visit, and they do sometimes visit this church. I once was accidentally a witness to their visit. It was really... Um, was really official but yes they came and um you know walked around the church and it was really special <laughs> anyway um so we have seen a lot today we we started with uh the church on spilled blood with the gorgeous onion shaped domes then we saw um the beautiful kazan cathedral with the people lining up to kiss an icon we saw the church that used to be a swimming pool, a church that used to be a movie theater, a church that used to be an anti-religion museum. And finally, we saw the burial place of our whole Russian royal family. So we saw a lot of churches. Do you have any questions about anything that we have seen so far? Or anything that you want to share? It was really good and quite informative. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, Kamna, thank you so much. I'm so glad that you liked it. Yeah. I have to go, uh, Olga, but I really enjoyed it very, very much. Thank you so much for doing this lovely. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> Bye, Ruth. Uh, oh, and thank you, Gaylene, for the thumbs up. <laughs> All right, uh, let me really quickly show you um, the ways that uh, you can get in, uh, stay in touch with us, as I promised. Just a second. Uh, we have a Facebook page that is Eagle Travel Tours to Russia. Please feel free to follow us there. And an Instagram page. Eagle Travel. So feel free to find us Eagle Travel on Instagram, Eagle Travel Tours to Russia on Facebook. And if you do want to leave a tip, here is my PayPal page. The link is simple. It's paypal.me, so paypal.me slash Olga Russia. Paypal.me slash Olga Russia. Um, if that doesn't work for some reason, feel free to reach out. Uh, I can copy and paste the link to you. But once again, paypal.me slash Olga Russia. I hope that we stay in touch. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us again today. And um, yeah, I'm doing these free tours every Thursday and I try to make them different every time. So I hope you uh, join us again. <laughs> and thanks again for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.